and welcome back to another video from this little corner of the internet. Hi, my name is Lillian. If you're new here, I really enjoy talking about books and writing and storytelling in general. It has been a little bit since I filmed a video, so I do apologize, but I felt like it was high time that I discussed the books that I read in the month of March. I read a total of 15 books, 12 of those were graphic novels, and the rest were fiction novels. So I will be discussing both the graphic novels as well as the fiction novels. If you're not a fan of graphic novels, if you're not interested, I will leave the timestamp where you can jump to um, to where I start talking about the fiction novels that I read. Um, but if you are interested in hearing about the graphic novels that I read this month, um, let's dive on into it. Also, I do apologize for the glare that you're going to see on my glasses. I film in front of a window and just the way that the light is hitting and the time of day can't be helped. Believe me, it's also definitely annoying me as well. <laughs> if you're new to these wrap-ups, I like to start with the books that I enjoyed the least and work up to the books that I enjoyed the most that month. And so at the bottom of the pile for graphic novels this month is The Court Charade by Flore Vesco. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that, she's French. This was published in 2022 by Europe Comics um, and was translated from the French into English, uh, I believe in the same year. And on the surface, this definitely sounded like a story that would be up my alley. It takes place in a pseudo-historical setting that resembles very closely the Palace of Versailles. Uh, probably during the reign of King Louis the 14th or 15th. And we follow our main character, Serene, who has come to the palace um, away from her very controlling mother who is trying to teach her how to be a lady. Uh, she's fled to the palace to try and make a name for herself and gets swept up into becoming a lady-in-waiting for the queen. She somehow manages to land the position of lady-in-waiting with the queen and is then brought into this world of frilly gowns, underhanded catfights, uh, very petty uh, things that the other ladies in waiting do and say. Personally, I found Serene as a main character to be incredibly annoying. Throughout the story, she's very much characterized as this very obtusely quirky, um, I'm not like other girls girl, which I found to be very grating. The way that Serene was characterized uh, definitely annoyed me, but also the way that most of the other female characters in this graphic novel were characterized. And if you'll pardon the mini rant that I'm about to embark on, um, I'm someone who's very passionate about history. I was a history major. I know for this graphic novel and many other, you know, period dramas or historical inspired stories, um, they are pseudo-history. They aren't necessarily drawn directly from history, but they're very clearly inspired by history. And even stories that are directly inspired by history. Um, I'm just very, very tired of seeing modern stories um, of female characters in historical settings turning up their nose at the fashions of the day um, and assuming that anything to do with corsets or frills or fashion meant that you couldn't be forward thinking for your day. Throughout this graphic novel, Serene definitely scoffs and turns up her nose at the queen and the ladies in waiting um, because they are so enamored with frilly pretty things. Um, and. The queen and her ladies-in-waiting are characterized as being incredibly vapid, vain, and unintellectual because they are interested in these things. And for me, the thing that really sticks in my craw is this modern attitude that we are somehow inherently above or wildly progressed from the lives of especially our female ancestors when it comes to clothing and fashion and just the way that things were done. So editing Lillian here, I don't think I fully got the point I was trying to make across. Basically, I find the modern outlook of thinking that things people said or did in the past being inherently inferior or backwards to be ignorant and short-sighted. This mindset that we are inherently superior to people of the past and that we have continued on this constant upward swing of progress very quickly starts to fall apart when you actually start to look at history. Um, I will link to a video by Carolina Zabroska um, that she titled, Why Do We Act Like People in the Past Are Stupid? And she goes into more depth and detail about this and I would highly recommend giving it a watch. All right, back to this video. I am so, so tired of seeing the very lazy and untrue metaphor of the corset as a restrictive garment, um, that it was somehow a symbol of women's oppression. It's just, it's overly simplistic, it's lazy and downright annoying to me at this point. Historical costuming rant aside, um, the narrative and the plot for this graphic novel were also all over the place and at points felt like it was rather difficult to follow uh, and especially towards the end it felt like there were a number of plot points that were just pulled out of thin air in order to tie up loose ends or for the sake of drama and a plot twist that didn't 
quite make sense. And the last thing that I will say about this graphic novel and why I did not enjoy it is the attempt at dark humor with the head torturer and his torture assistant that live in the dungeon. It just did not sit well with me the way that the sort of, I guess, narrative joke was constructed that the prisoners who resided in the palace dungeons absolutely loved the torturer, uh, that they were very happy to be there, that they couldn't wait for it to be their turn. Um, and it was supposed to be, I guess, sort of a very dark tongue-in-cheek kind of a joke. It just didn't sit well with me, especially knowing um, that in the time period that the story is sort of based around, um, you have methods of torture that are just um, really despicable. And I, I'll just, you know, flat out say torture itself is despicable. I was not a fan of the story. Um, yeah, I gave this one and a half out of five stars. And the reason I didn't rate it lower is the art itself is actually um, very beautiful, very nice to look at. Although it did kind of seem at odds with the story that it was trying to tell, the way that it was illustrated felt very much almost like a children's story or a children's picture book. Yeah, it just, it did not sit well with me. I was not a fan of this one. Uh, the next graphic novel that I'm going to mention is Fun Girl by Elizabeth Pitch. Uh, this was published in 2021 by Silver Sprocket, and Fun Girl follows a hot mess, very messy young woman uh, crashing through her own life as well as the lives of those around her, um, leaving chaos in her wake. She's very much of a um, tornado. The humor of this graphic novel is very dark, very crude, and at the end of the day I just I don't think it was for me, um, the, the sense of humor itself. Overall I didn't think that this story's uh, very vulgar dark humor was well balanced with a certain level of charm that I think can make that kind of a story work, at least for me. And maybe for some people that's fine if you really do enjoy very dark, very crude humor. If you like humor that is very exaggerated, very shocking, um, graphic, especially when it comes to sexual humor as well as humor involving corpses, um, you might get a kick out of this story. Personally, it just was not for me and I gave it one and a half out of five stars as well. Next up on the list of graphic novels that I'm going to talk about is Hen Kai Pan, I think is how you say it, and this is by Eldo Yoshimuzi, um, and was published in 2022 by Titan Comics. Um, so I picked this up not realizing that this was also by the author of uh, Ryoku Volume 1, which I read last month and really didn't get along with. To be fair, I feel like this was very much a stronger graphic novel than Ryoku Volume 1 was. The art was very well done. You could actually tell what was going on in uh, all of the panels, as opposed to with Ryoku, um, a number of the fight scenes, actually most of the fight scenes, were so dark and convoluted it was kind of impossible to tell what was actually going on. Um, that was not the case in this graphic novel. In addition, I found the narrative of Hen Kai Pan to be much more interesting than Ryoku was as well, um, but still pretty convoluted and at times difficult to follow. The story in the graphic novel follows five guardian spirits of Earth, um, that are dismayed by the havoc that is being wrought on the planet by humanity. And so they are all sort of debating what the course of action should be going forward in order to remedy the situation when one of these guardian spirits uh, decides to go rogue and wipe out all life on Earth, and so puts the other four in the position of having to attempt to stop her in some kind of way. So that concept itself I find interesting, however there really was zero context given to any of the characters, you are just sort of dropped into the narrative as it is happening. There is no explanation um, as to who or what is going on, and it feels like you're being dropped in in the middle of an action scene, um, and you have to very much piece together what's going on, and not in a not in an intuitive way or one that makes sense. It just it felt convoluted and um, confusing to me. It wasn't until I got towards the end that I could kind of clearly discern who these characters were and. What their motivations could potentially be. And in a somewhat similar vein to Ryoku Volume 1, I didn't feel like this graphic novel could stand on its own two legs and would have needed to sort of maybe been produced in conjunction with something else in order for it to make sense, um, but that was not the case. I gave this two out of five stars. Next up we have Who Will Make the Pancakes by Megan Kelso. This is a collection of graphic short stories or illustrated short stories comic short stories. I'm not quite sure how to categorize them or, or label them, but um, this was published in 2022 by Fantagraphics and is a collection of five short stories that have been written by the author, illustrated by the author over the last 15 years or so. 
Um, I was initially very interested and intrigued by the idea of a graphic novel illustrated short story collection, but in reading this I found that the execution of it was just kind of okay for me. The summary of this collection describes it as exploring the connective tissue that binds us together despite our own interior and exterior selves and experiences. In part, I think one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy this collection was the art style for each of them. One, it is different uh, for each story, which I did appreciate, but overall the art style didn't feel like it married well with some of the themes and topics that were being discussed. Um, for me, the, the art style felt a little bit more like Saturday morning cartoons, which um, kind of felt at odds for some of the deeper topics that were being explored, and I think that might just be a personal thing for me. Secondly, I didn't feel like there was a full level of catharsis when it came to a lot of the themes that were being explored in these stories. Um, it felt like we were scratching at the surface of a lot of the themes that were being touched on, but not really going much further than that. So in the end, I ended up rating this two and a half out of five stars. Next up, I read Book Love by Debbie Tung. Uh, this was published in 2019 by Andrews McNeil Publishing. This is very much a lighthearted art book, more so than it is a graphic novel. There isn't uh, a clear narrative or plot running through it. We do follow this recurring character of a young woman who is a bibliophile. She loves and adores books um, and all things reading and stories. Each page or two is illustrated with either a single panel or a series of panels sort of um, with little anecdotes about her love of reading and little scenarios that are very cute and related to being an avid reader. Again, this was very cute, very lighthearted, it could definitely be used as a palette cleanser if you're in the mood for that kind of a thing. Um, it felt very much like the uh, each of the panels or each of the illustrations could be, you know, an Instagram post that is then shared around about, you know, the um, highs and lows of being a reader. Um, sort of like a little webcomic, um, if you will. Overall, I thought it was very cute. I didn't necessarily identify with all of the, I guess, sentiments or scenarios that were explored or expressed uh, within the art book itself, but I could definitely appreciate it. Next up, we have Onion Skin by Edgar Camacho. This was originally published in Mexico, but was then translated into English in 2016 by Top Shelf Productions. In the story, we follow a young man named Rolando who is very disenchanted with his very mundane job and decides to break away from it and try and start something new after meeting um, a carefree young woman named Nara on a night out with some friends. They are united by their love of food and they decide to start up a food truck business because Nara, uh, when they meet, is living in a food truck that was given to her by a friend. So they establish their food truck, go on the road, and end up becoming very popular due to the food that they make, the spices that they use, but also their presence on social media, and they are subsequently pulled into a food truck war with a rival group. The story itself seemed to have promise, but for me the way that the narrative was structured felt very haphazard and difficult to follow. Um, we sort of follow two oppositional timelines coming together like this. There are flashbacks and current timelines sort of running all over the place, and it was very difficult to follow. Uh, and for most of the book I thought we were following two different couples, maybe that were alternate reality versions of the other one, but it was very difficult to tell, at least for me, that we were following the same couple throughout the entire book. I think I ended up giving this one a 2.75 out of 5 stars. The next graphic novel that I'm going to talk about is Hypericon by Manuel Fior, I think is how you say his name. This was published earlier this year in February of 2023 by Europe Comics. Um, I had the opportunity to read a free version of this graphic novel for NetGalley in exchange for an honest review. So Hypericon is a graphic novel with two narratives running parallel to each other. The first narrative being that of the famous British Egyptologist Howard Carter who discovered King Tut's tomb in 1922. Um, right as he was on the brink of financial and career ruin. And the second narrative that we're following is a young Italian woman named Teresa who is coming to Berlin in 2001. She's fresh off the plane uh, from Italy and she is pursuing um, an opportunity of a lifetime for her and that is a student assistant position working with museum that is creating an exhibition of the great goods of this very tomb. Personally, as a child that was utterly obsessed with ancient Egypt, I was very pleased to see that a number of the panels that were illustrating 
Carter's narrative were either direct replicas or very similar to some of the uh, snapshot photos that were taken of the discovery of King Tut's tomb, replicating sort of where people were standing or expressions on their face. I also really enjoyed the parallel narrative of Teresa, a young woman sort of teetering on this uh, brink of uncertainty um, of either great success or sort of falling off the path that she is so desperate to pursue, very much mirroring the narrative of Howard Carter that we're also seeing. Teresa suffers from insomnia, and so when she can't sleep, she finds comfort in reading Carter's notes and write-ups about the excavation that took place in 1922 in the Valley of the Kings. Once she arrives to Berlin, Teresa starts to develop a somewhat double life. On the one hand, she is a very hardworking, very high-achieving uh, professional in her field, and another where she's living in a squat with a man named Ruben that she met in Berlin on her first day there um, and who she doesn't really know much about aside from the fact that he's very much a free carefree spirit um, that is in a lot of ways in opposition to her very straightforward much more conservative outlook on life. Over the course of living together Teresa and Ruben do develop a romantic relationship um, for me personally, this was a weak point in the narrative. It didn't feel like Ruben's plotline in any way sort of like assisted or bolstered the narrative of Teresa, especially in regards to the already pre-established parallel narrative that we had going on with Teresa and Howard Carter. And also personally, I just, I didn't get their dynamic. I didn't understand why Teresa decided to stick with Ruben and continue the relationship throughout the graphic novel uh, and into the epilogue because Ruben constantly tunes out or ignores Teresa when she's talking about things that she's passionate about, things like Carter's discovery, her love of ancient languages and ancient cultures. He just, you know, does not want to hear it. I felt like their relationship was more so heavily based on sex and not much else. There are graphic depictions of sex in this graphic novel, just a heads up. To me, it felt like this relationship was a distraction from the overall narrative that was going on um, and was sort of a missed opportunity. Lastly, I'm guessing that the author intended there to be some level of significance uh, in the epilogue when Teresa is sort of able to start overcoming her insomnia when she sleeps through um, television coverage of a major world event. I will not spoil it, but I'm sure you can guess as this takes place in 2000. However, it wasn't clear what the significance of using this uh, world event was. It felt like the use of this major world event was a bit um, arbitrary as well as voyeuristic. However, overall, I would say that I did enjoy this graphic novel. I definitely would have preferred a lesser focus or emphasis on the relationship between Teresa and Ruben um, and a greater exploration of Teresa's coming of age um, running parallel with the historical narratives that we had going on. Overall, I gave this graphic novel three out of five stars. The next graphic novel that I wanted to discuss is Queenie, Godmother of Harlem. This is by Elizabeth Columba. Um, and was published in 2023 by Harry and Abrams Press. This is a historical graphic novel based on the life of Harlem's legendary female mobster, Stephanie St. Clair. St. Clair was a criminal legend in 1930s Harlem and worked her way to become the queen mobster of Harlem's mafia via racketeering and bootlegging during Prohibition. She was a very fierce defender of the black community in New York City and for the most part used the majority of the funds that she gained in order to assist families in need and people in her community in need. The main narrative in this graphic novel focuses on St. Clair at the end of her mobster career as the end of Prohibition is on the horizon and she's coming under the threat of the Italian mob who is attempting to overtake her operation. We also get flashbacks to her childhood um, where she grew up on a plantation in the French colony of Martinique, I think is how you say it, which she escaped in 1912 before making her way to New York City and making a name for herself. Overall, I really liked this graphic novel. I really appreciated getting to learn more about the life of this historical figure that I wasn't aware of before. Um, the one thing I will say is a somewhat critique of this graphic novel is just the illustration style felt very sparse. It was very um, delicate line work and there wasn't much, I would say, visual depth to some of the illustrations, but I think for me that is just sort of a personal preference. Overall, I think the graphic novel is really great, and I gave it three and a half out of five stars. The next graphic novel that I read in March and want to discuss is Scott Pilgrim Volume 1 by Brian Lee O'Malley. Um, this originally came out in 2004 with Oni Press. I think Scott Pilgrim is very much a household name within the graphic novel reading community, or even if you don't read graphic novels, you may have heard of Scott Pilgrim 
just as a cultural phenomenon or also having watched the movie that came out. Scott Pilgrim is one of my partner's favorite graphic novel series and so I've definitely wanted to get around to it and so I started with the first volume last month after having watched the movie of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World with him I think a year or two ago. So I saw the movie before heading into this series and I think that definitely helped shape my mindset going into the series itself. I definitely enjoyed the first volume where we meet Scott and some of the cast of characters and we get to see where he starts off as a character. I'm definitely looking forward to see where this series goes, what points you know may have had to have been left out of the movie that may add more context to the story and the characters, um, and also I'm looking forward to seeing Scott's uh, progression and development as a character. Um, because, spoiler alert, maybe not spoiler alert, he does start off as kind of a jerk. I thought the first volume was a lot of fun and I gave it 4.25 out of 5 stars. Next up I read the graphic novel Shining Beacon by James Albon. I think this is the second graphic novel that I've read by James Albon and I have really enjoyed both of them so far. Shining Beacon came out in 2019 with Top Shelf Production. This is a really wonderful graphic novel that explores the role of the artist uh, within a speculative near future United Kingdom that has been overtaken by a very nationalistic, some would say fascist authoritarian uh, regime. We follow the artist Francesca Saxon as she is called on by this governmental regime uh, to come to the capital and paint a mural for a large uh, swimming pool this, that is being built in the city in sort of honor of this new regime and is being styled with all kinds of different art, um, alluding to the glory of the regime. So she leaves her small coastal town and her husband um, and comes to live and work in the big city. She ends up being tossed between and mixed up with regime committees that are obsessed with propaganda and image as well as violent underground revolutionaries who are also obsessed with image and messaging. Torn between and used by both of these factions, this graphic novel definitely explores um, what happens when ideology gets a stranglehold on art and the artist. I really did enjoy this graphic novel so far. I have really adored both of the graphic novels that I've read by James Albron. The previous one that I read by him was his more recent one, Delicacy. Um, I really love his illustration style. It is very much each panel feels like a painting. And I also have really enjoyed the themes and topics that he has written on. I ended up giving A Shining Beacon four and a half out of five stars. The next graphic novel that I wanted to share and discuss with you is Parallel by Matthias Lehman. This comes out on my birthday, June 13th of this year. Um, comes out with Oni Press and I was given the opportunity to read an arc of this graphic novel in exchange for an honest review for NetGalley. Parallel is a fantastic graphic novel set in post-World War II Germany. It follows the life of Karl Kling, who is a closeted gay man who is chafing against the binds of society and his need to conform due to the necessity of keeping his identity secret because at this time homosexuality was a crime in Germany. Um, violence was very much an issue against openly gay men. I will give forewarning that there are some instances of violent homophobia depicted in this graphic novel, but Carl attempts to create a normal domestic life, fly under the radar, but repeatedly has to contend with his attraction to men um, and what that means for him and his family. The story itself is told through a blend of flashbacks to Carl's past as a young man as well as when he's in his 60s or 70s and he's attempting to reach out to his daughter who has somewhat disowned him uh, several years ago and is no longer speaking with him. He writes her a letter and invitation hoping that she'll come and see him on his birthday and they can attempt to start and repair their relationship. The art in this graphic novel is really gorgeous and I felt like there was a very beautiful balance between the visual storytelling as well as the dialogue and written narrative that we are given. The story of Carl's life is honest, heartfelt, and bittersweet in many ways. I found Carl himself to be a very compelling character and one whose story is both unique as well as familiar. As a character, Carl attempts to live a socially acceptable life um, parallel to his own truth. This being a common experience for queer folks throughout history, Parallel is a deep look into one gay man's life and experience um, and the pitfalls uh, that came with it. The interweaving of the various timelines of Carl's life 
throughout the story felt very natural, very organic. It felt very easy and intuitive to follow for me. The jumping backwards and forwards along the timeline of Carl's life felt very authentic um, and ended up weaving together very beautifully and very organically into a cohesive story. In addition, I found the plotting and the pacing of the story in the graphic novel to be very well timed. I actually ended up reading this graphic novel in one sitting. I picked it up and couldn't put it down. I was really compelled by the story as well as the art. I really adored this graphic novel. I ended up giving it five out of five stars and if it sounds interesting to you, I would highly recommend checking it out when it comes out in June of this year. And the last graphic novel that I'm going to talk about is Stone Fruit by Lee Lai. I think it's how you say her name. Um, this was published in 2021 by Fantagraphics. I don't know if I've ever used the label of literary fiction to describe a graphic novel before, but this felt like a literary fiction graphic novel to me. I was utterly blown away by this graphic novel. The narrative and the illustration came together exquisitely. The narrative was raw, bittersweet, and deeply reflective. We follow the story of Braun and Ray, a queer couple who enjoy being the weird, wild aunties to Ray's six-year-old niece, Nessie. They take her on playdates to the woods and run wild and uh, create these very imaginative adventures, which helps ease the weight that each of them carries in their lives ping-ponging between family tensions and deep-seated personal stumbling blocks. We see Ray and Bronze's emotional intimacy start to crumble um, as they both turn away from each other in order to attempt to repair some of the family ties that they each have. I don't want to give too much away about the actual plot of this graphic novel, but just know that it is gorgeous and bittersweet and very much worth your time. Again, this graphic novel felt very literary, very sophisticated, and I haven't stopped thinking about it. So likewise, I also gave it five out of five stars. Okay, so we have finally reached the fiction section of this video, and I have four fiction books to discuss with you. The first one being a DNF, and that was Exalted by Anna Dorn. This was published in 2022 by The Unnamed Press. In this book, we're following two parallel narratives. First, we have Emily, who is a popular astrology Instagrammer, blogger. Um, she runs an Instagram called Exalted. Um, and makes a living giving readings to her followers. And then we also follow Dawn, who is an avid follower of the Exalted page, who is a middle-aged lesbian with anger issues and history of abusive tendencies. I put this down after having listened to about a third of the audiobook um, because I absolutely could not stand the characters. They were both incredibly self-centered and short-sighted. Now, personally, I don't mind unlikable characters, but for me, I need them to have some level of redeemable quality to them, some semblance of character growth in order to make reading about them worthwhile for me, or at least bearable to read. Where I stopped with the story, and based on some of the other reviews that I have seen other people give this book, neither Emily or Dawn ever really end up having redeemable qualities. We just continue to follow their very crappy, selfish decisions. I get that in some regards this book is attempting to be a critique on and a satire of modern astrology pop culture and how people will often take, you know, points from astrology or memes from an astrology count and use that as validation for themselves, for who they are, as well as uh, being able to pigeonhole other people in their life into various categories based on their star signs. Personally, I just don't think that it was a successful satire for me or that it did this well, um, at least to the point where I read. And lastly, I did listen to this on audiobook, and I think personally this is the first time that I have ever really not gotten along with an audiobook narrator. The narrator that did the audiobook for this uh, just very much sounded robotic and monotone and was very irritating. Um, I don't know if that was a creative directive choice um, or if it was just what the voice actor decided to do, but all of these things contributed to my overall dislike and disinterest in continuing uh, finishing this book. The next book that I'm going to discuss is a big one as far as popularity goes, and that is My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshvig. This came out in 2018 with Penguin Press. Um, this is my second encounter with Moshvig after having read her short novella Maglu that came out previous to this. I definitely enjoyed My Year of Rest and Relaxation more than I did my experience reading Maglu. If Enjoy is a word that can be used to describe reading an Otessa Moshvig book. She is certainly known for her unlikable characters, not shying away from 
making the reader very uncomfortable uh, or depicting things that would be very much considered gross or horrible or taboo. I think being uncomfortable just sort of goes with the territory of reading Moshvig. As I was reading my year of rest and relaxation, I could definitely more clearly see the hype around her writing as far as the things that she was doing, the images that she was weaving, the sentences that she was constructing. I could see why people praise her writing, much more so than I was able to understand after having read McGlue. And I think personally for me, McGlue was just too gross. It was uncomfortable to the point where I just could not enjoy it. But a quick summary of my year of rest and relaxation, if you are unaware. Our narrator is a privileged orphan living in New York City. Um, after graduating Columbia University. She's an only child of wealthy parents who were very emotionally unavailable and somewhat manipulative, which leads her to struggle heavily with isolation, depression, and anxiety later on in life. And so she gets it into her head that all she really needs to do is take a year off of life and just get some good sleep, just sleep through the entire year. So she ends up finding a crackpot psychiatrist who is more than happy to prescribe her any number of pills, sleeping pills, anti-anxiety pills, anti-depression pills, tranquilizers, um, etc. And so she sets about trying to find a way to sleep through an entire year of her life. For me, I could definitely see the hype around Moshevig and her writing for most of this book. However, the ending of this book felt like a big disappointment to me. It felt like it was a little bit slapped together, like she didn't know where the wild ride of this story was going or supposed to end, or what she was actually trying to say in this book. I'll definitely go into detail and explain what I mean, but I will warn for spoilers, I will be discussing plot points at the very end of the book, so if you want to avoid spoilers, I will put a timestamp up on the screen to where you can skip to uh, to avoid them. So the issues that I had with the ending of this book, to me it didn't feel like Moshvig had totally thought out how she was thematically going to wrap up uh, the story of this narrator when she emerges from her pill-induced sleep rehab. The narrator supposedly wakes up and feels reborn after A, sleeping for months, B, getting rid of all of her worldly possessions, and C, making the decision to finally sell her parents' house um, after the renters move out and it needs to be put on the market anyway, as well as getting rid of all of their belongings. To me, it felt like Moshvig's metaphor of having material possessions be the stand-in for the memories and the trauma that our narrator has very clearly experienced and refuses to confront it didn't sit well with me and felt like a last-minute conclusion that had a lack of backing from the rest of the book. It wasn't something that I had noticed sort of pulled throughout uh, the rest of the book and just sort of felt like it was slapped on at the end as an explanation. And also having our very privileged, affluent, mentally ill narrator um, just deciding to get rid of every single thing she owns except for maybe a couple pairs of clothes and underwear and some soap and food and that has sort of been one of the cathartic things that has helped heal her of all of this past trauma. Um, it just didn't sit well with me and it felt like another sense of disassociation that the character had been attempting to do throughout the entire book. She's trying to disassociate herself from her past and all of the emotions that come with it disassociate from her reality that is sort of triggering, you know, this cycle of depression and anxiety. And in the end she just sort of decides to disassociate from all of her material possessions and just sort of get rid of that and have those stand in for, you know, the metaphor of all of this baggage that she's carrying with her. Again, it was sort of slapped in in the last like 10 pages or so and it just felt, you know, haphazard. I also heard that the final statement that our narrator makes can be rather polarizing. For context, this story does take place from 2000 to 2001 in New York City and has a final scene that mentions 9-11. And our narrator tapes the news coverage and video coverage of the planes crashing into the buildings and specifically the video of um, a woman jumping out of the 78th floor of one of the buildings because our narrator thinks that it could potentially be her friend Riva, who worked in one of the towers and was killed that day. But I'll read a few quotes from the final page of this book just to sort of give you a little bit more context. But Riva was lost. Riva was gone. I watched the videotape over and over to soothe myself that day, and I continue to watch it. Usually on a lonely afternoon or any other time, I doubt that life is worth living, or when I need courage, or when I'm bored. 
Each time I see the woman leap off the 78th floor of the North Tower, one high-heeled shoe slipping off and hovering up over her, the other stuck on her foot as though it were too small, her blouse untucked, her hair flailing, limbs stiff as she plummets down, one arm raised like a dive into a summer lake. I am overcome by awe, not because she looks like Riva and I think it's her, almost exactly her, and not because Riva and I had been friends, or because I'll never see her again, but because she is beautiful. There she is, a human being, diving into the unknown, and she is wide awake." So that is the final paragraph of my year of rest and relaxation. And personally, I find this final scene, and especially the final line, to really kind of not sit well with me and kind of get under my skin. Again, it felt like Moshvik was kind of scrambling in order to tie up loose ends at the end of the story and slapped on this final scene that referenced this, you know, world event that was very traumatic as a way to give the ending meaning gravitas. And I think the thing that really gets me about that final line, uh, Moshvik saying that she was diving into the unknown uh, wide awake. In reality, the woman who's jumping out of that tower was knowingly jumping to her death. She was choosing between, you know, dying by fire, dying if the building collapsed on her, um, or taking it into her own hands and throwing herself out of the building. She was by no means jumping into the unknown unless you're trying to make the illusion of jumping into death and the unknown of what happens after death. And even then I don't think that that's what Moshvig intended because she has the narrator previous to that final line saying that she would rewatch this recording of this woman jumping out of the building over and over again when she needed to soothe herself, when she felt like life wasn't worth living, or when she was bored. It just, the ending very much irritated me, got under my skin, was not a fan of it. I would say 90% of the rest of the book I did appreciate and enjoy, but it, the ending kind of soured it a bit for me. Uh, I ended up giving the book 3 out of 5 stars. To me it just felt like this book kind of fell flat on its face at the end. The next book that I'll talk about isn't specifically a fiction book, um, but it's not a graphic novel either. Um, but it is The Book of Days by Patti Smith, and this came out in 2022 with Random House. This in essence is a photography book uh, with 365 photographs taken by Patti Smith herself, and each photograph is assigned to a day of the year and has a caption that is written by Patti Smith herself. And so the intention with this book is that you can read it over the course of a year, reading, you know, one page per day. Personally, I ended up reading this book all in one sitting because a uh, little story time, I was going to the library to pick up my library holds uh, and I was not expecting to have this one come in so soon and knowing that it had come from another library I didn't want to send it back and have to request it again so I had a little bit of time on my hands and I sat down and read it all in one sitting. I will say that I definitely enjoyed the experience of reading this book although I don't think I read it in the way that is recommended. It was really fun getting to see insights and snapshots into Patti Smith's life both past and present. It is a very quick read. I don't know if I would personally recommend reading it all in one sitting. I think you would definitely get more out of it if you read it, you know, over the course of time, maybe in large chunks still, or if you wanted to take it day by day. Nevertheless, I still definitely enjoyed it. I gave it four out of five stars. And the last and final book that I'm going to talk about in this wrap up is Two Roads by Joseph Brochak. This came out in 2018 with Dial Books. I'm slowly making my way through Joseph Brochak's backlog. He is an Abenaki scholar um, and author and storyteller who writes quite a lot of middle grade um, relating to indigenous people's backgrounds and stories. And overall, I have really been enjoying his books, and I think this one is my new favorite by him. In this story, we follow Cal Black and his father as they ride the rails after having lost their farm during the Great Depression and having Cal's mother pass away from illness. Cal's father is a World War One vet who, when he hears that there is going to be a march of vets on Washington to demand from Herbert Hoover that they receive their promised severance pay. So when he hears that thousands of other vets are gearing up for this march on Washington, he feels obligated to join them, but knows that it would not be a safe place to bring Cal with him. So he ends up placing Cal in the same Indian boarding school that he himself was raised in after having to tell Cal that he is half Creek Indian. So we then follow Cal as he experiences life at the Indian boarding school and also him being reunited with his father. I really loved this story. I thought it was really well crafted, but also it was very informative. I think it did a great job of teaching the reader about this time period, about sort of 
what life might have been like for someone like Cal and his father. And I think it also covers a period of American history that isn't necessarily widely taught in schools. I think Brochak definitely writes some fantastic middle grade and I am very much excited to continue reading his backlog. I ended up giving it this book 5 out of 5 stars. And so that is it my friends. Those are the 15 books that I've read in the month of March. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. If you enjoyed this video, you can give it a thumbs up. It definitely helps support my channel, helps it grow. If you'd like to see more book review and book content in general, feel free to subscribe. I do my best to post once a week. And with that, I think I need to wrap up this video so I can get it out to you all. Um, I hope you all are doing well. I hope you're enjoying what you're reading and I will see you in my next video. Bye.